It's called the last mile for machine learning. You can call it AI Square, it's the name of the company. You can consider it the final connector, or maybe even a truck that makes your deliveries, or a washing machine. We'll explain it all with the CEO right now at the NASDAQ market site. Hello everyone, it's Jabbar Young, senior writer here at Forbes at the NASDAQ market site, and I am joined by the CEO of AI Squared, Dr. Benjamin Harvey. Now, AI Squared it is a machine learning, right? And machine learning and AI company takes all of that data and allows companies to make the final decisions of their business outcome. Did I, I say that correctly? Oh, wow. Oh, that's phenomenal. Dr. Harvey, thank you so much for joining us, man. Appreciate I'm the time. Excited to be here. That's great. Well, listen, man, I always start off the month with uh, the theme of the month, right? And this theme of April is Financial Literacy Month. So I will ask you, what's the biggest tip that you can give people about financial literacy? So you're a doctor, right? <laughs> I know, you got your PhD, so you, you better be good. <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, so, so my background, I've, I've got a PhD in computer science, and, but I've always had this entrepreneurial mindset, right? And, you know, one of the biggest challenges from, you know, going from a, a, a technical role inside of large enterprise organizations to being able to understand how to, you know, for me, take a technology and understand go-to-market strategies across different organizations, you know, understanding customer segments. So it's like, it's like business one-on-one, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, uh, with a technical degree, many um, academic institutions don't really push the aspect of understanding um, the business side of technology. Mm -hmm. so, so really, when I think about you know, for the younger generation and next generation of entrepreneurs that are out there, you know, it's really important as you think about, you know, the explosion of AI to focus on, you know, the core technology. But also, if you have any entrepreneurial bone in your body, it's super important to also understand the business aspects, the financial aspects and motivations of organizations as you go to, you know, transition from, you know, a core technical um, role to more of a, you know, owner of a business and really driving business outcomes. Yeah, would you uh, would you say if that tip you can give, would it be, you know, maybe, you know, learning profit loss sheets or anything in financial literacy? What would be the biggest tip? In one sentence, one sentence, what's the biggest tip? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things our investors really focus on are, you know, P&Ls. P&Ls. Right, really being able to understand, you know, that balance statement from end to end and really being able to, um, create performer projections that can help you understand you know how you need to posture your business for ultimate success in the future yeah now i gotta go back home and read all my business books man because i didn't focus too much on the profit loss now i was <laughs> testing you there to see what you're gonna say uh hey man listen thank you so much again for joining us and you're kind of coming up here on a, on a forbes exclusive in a way right you guys are just coming off of your serious a fundraise fund fundraise a 13.8 million dollar raise and is uh featuring investors including tiaa ceo Robert, Roger Ferguson, um, along with New Enterprise Associates and uh, uh, Ansa Capital, New York-based uh, venture firm here. 13.8 million Series A, total 20 million. You had a 6 million seed round in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Take me inside of this 13.8 million Series A and what AI Squared is gonna do in the AI space with this money. Yeah, you know, so, you know, j just, you know, just to start off with a little bit of the journey, you know, kind of where we are now in the movie and how we're going to leverage the resources to really drive us to, you know, that next unicorn. Yeah. Um, you know, so really, you know, the impetus, the impetus of um, how we came into fruition was really um, some work that started um, at the National Security Agency. Mm -hmm. Where you worked. Yep, yeah. exactly. So I was the um, chief of operations data science and uh, I was also the head of data science for the Edward Snowden leaks. and. Um, in those positions, what we saw is that 90% of AI and machine learning technologies never made it into a, a mission um, production application, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about, you know, there are you know, thousands of data scientists that are actually building world-class artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities and technologies, but when you think about, are they actually coming to life for the business and in the federal government for mission operations. So, you know, we really set on a journey to solve that problem so that we can really get those AI and machine learning technologies out of that experimental sandbox and into the hands of the people in the business, as well as from a mission operation perspective, 
the analysts and the military warfighter, which are the individuals that ultimately needed those insights the most to, you know, in, 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 in many situations, help save lives. So, yeah. you know, really, you know, where AI Squared is right now, you know, we've been able to do, you know, amazing work where we're solving what we, what we identify as this last mile of AI problem um, in Fortune uh, 500 financial services organizations. Um, we're working with, you know, great cybersecurity organizations like Rapid7. Um, we're also working with, you know, great organizations like Johns Hopkins um, Applied Physics Lab. Um, we're also working, you know, across, you know, um, the CPG landscape with uh, Coca-Cola Florida. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't stop there. We've also been able to amass many federal contracts, you know, from the um, NSA to the NGA to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NSA, National Security Agency, all the way through to um, in the Department of Defense, including the Navy as well as the Air Force. So really at this point, it's about how can we take those use cases in these different customer segments and really drive some repeatability in the market yeah. so that we can see the ultimate, you know, full commercialization potential of the actual technology. So that includes things like, you know, how can we, you know, uh, expand the product teams, you know, how can we, you know, really build a go-to-market motion, right, when, you know, historically, you know, um, it was founder-led sales. But now we want to really be able to bring in a CRO, build out a sales team across commercial, strategic, and enterprise reps, and be able to take those use cases in consumer packaged goods, health and life sciences, um, cybersecurity, um, you know, and, and really push to see the extent of the agnostic capability that we built in this last mile platform to really drive business across different customers. Yeah. Now you tell me something. I, I had my head was was spinning. Not now, right? Not now. It's still <laughs> spinning. Not now. Um, but you know, when me and you first spoke, right, about a week ago, you called me up and we were going through this, and I'm listening. And I turned the volume on the TV down. I'm like, all right, he's sitting on something. I don't know what it is. And I had to go through it all weekend, man. I'm talking to your investors, and I used an analogy, this analogy, that analogy. We settled, right? We settled on the washing machine <laughs> analogy, right? And so if I had to go deep into your company, because I was telling you, I said, listen, pretend I'm a third grader. How would you tell me what this company is? And we landed on the washing machine now. So you go, you take all this AI data, you take the machine learning, you take the, the learnings, the yeses from the algorithms, you put it all in a washing machine, right? And your investor, I love what he said at, over at NEA, he said, well, it's not only a wash, it's an ultimate superior washing machine because right. after you do this, after you wash that data again, the data that we're getting, right, that washing machine then dries it, then it, it folds the clothes for you and it stacks it up nice and neat. Whereas the process where we are right now is, is that companies are washing this data and leaving it on the floor after they wash it, right? They, there's nothing to do with And this is where the last mile problem, right? Trying to understand how do we get products, new software, new tech in the hands of our customers and employees. And AI Squared says, hey, we've solved this issue. It's almost like the final connector portion of it, right? Getting the piece of, of, of delivery to your house yes. via the truck. I tell people, if you want to be rich, own a trucking company. You can buy nothing without a truck getting it to wherever it needs to get to. Did I describe AI squared? Is that the cry? Is it the washing machine for AI? I said that right. I love that. Great. Lo My I, head is I, not spinning <laughs> anymore. Great. I can stop watching the exorcism. Great. So it, that is the correct way. It's the washing machine for for AI. I I, I love that analogy. Great. Um, and the reason I love it so much is because if you think about, um, as you mentioned, over the past five plus years, um, or the, the the landscape of AI has been really focused on, you know, building these world-class AI and machine learning algorithms, mm -hmm. right? But if you think about it, the, the value for organizations is really leveraging the output of those models, the insights that are being derived from those algorithms yeah. to drive the decision-making within the organization. So in order to be able to derive insights, you first need data within the organization, right? But not just data from one place, you need data from multiple places. Mm -hmm. So the pieces of clothing could come from different parts of the, um, of the house, right? And in our, our perspective, the enterprise organization. And we have to be able to reach out to those different places where the data lives, put it inside of this washing machine with the algorithms, and then we're pushing out the insights. But as you mentioned, right, we're just not uh, providing the insights to the end user or to the customer. We are actually, you know, um, when you think about you know, the contextualization that's associated with making actionable decisions. We're, you know, providing it in a timely fashion. We're providing it um, where, you know, you have additional 
um, you know, visualizations to really help guide you in making the right decision. So the analogy is perfect because we start with multiple sources of information, multiple models. We condense it down as we're churning and pulling out the insights and we deliver those directly to that customer. Absolutely. Listen, uh, as you enter from growth stage, right, or from venture stage to growth stage, I mean, not profitable yet, um, hope to be there one day soon. What's the biggest positive surprise, right? Because now you're the CEO of a company, get into your background a little bit because it's quite impressive. <laughs> but what's the biggest positive surprise that you've had and that you've learned uh, running AI Square to CEO? Yeah. You know, I think through through this journey, you know, one of the things uh, that you learn is there's going to be so many things that happen that just go wrong during the entrepreneurial journey. And and for me, you know, I started, um, you know, with a PhD in computer science from uh, Bowie State University. I went to Harvard and MIT for uh, some postgraduate work where I focused on, you know, building you know, um, world-class AI and machine learning algorithms across large-scale cancer genomics data sets. And um, I ultimately ended, ended up being recruited by the NSA, and I started a career as a federal civilian servant. And, you know, ultimately for me, um, the transition from the federal government to, you know, a, a Silicon Valley startup, right? Because I knew all about problem mission fit in the federal government but I had no idea what it means to actually uh, incubate a technology, um, commercialize it, and ultimately go to market with it from a product, um, a, um, product um, market fit perspective, mm -hmm. right? So um, for, for myself, you know, one of the, the, the biggest challenges, but also the biggest opportunity, um, was to start a process where you're learning and you're having to put those lessons into action as quickly as possible so that you can ultimately drive the success of a business, right? And, you know, working at Databricks, you know, um, a shout out to uh, Matei Zaria, Ali Gosi, Jan Stoica, Arsalan, uh, who are some of the co-founders that, you know, helped me, you know, and, I, and I call Databricks, Databricks University, mm -hmm. right? Because they ultimately taught me what, it, what was necessary to incubate a technology, commercialize it, go to market with it, build out awesome sales teams, go to market motions, product teams that could ultimately help you build a billion dollar unicorn, right? So, you know, the challenge was getting enough courage to leave the federal government, but I landed in an awesome organization working with the co-founders at Databricks, and Databricks University taught me everything that I needed to know to ultimately be successful um, at uh, AI squared. Yeah. So would you say that positive surprise was the fact that the transition was a little smoother than maybe you anticipated? What, what, what great, great, great point, 100%. I mean, you know, for me, you know, um, you know, one of the things uh, that I was able to do with uh, Matei Zaria, who's the uh, CTO at Databricks, you know, I, I sat down with him and I was able to tell him a little bit about the idea that I had and he thought it had huge implications with regards to the last mile in how you know Databricks builds world-class models and they want to make sure that the insights are actually being derived for their customers as well yeah. right so you know with that you know Matei helped me make the right connections to A16Z Nona Prize Associates as well as Battery and you know you know ultimately that journey was you know streamlined because of the proximity that I had in Silicon Valley the uh, network of individuals that I met and ultimately the advice as well as the um, direct connections that they provided for me to the right investors and ultimately Pete Sonsini um, uh, from New Enterprise Associates, he ended up leading our seed round of funding. Yeah, it was uh, Steve Jobs' lawyer's son. That's right. Day, That's you know, right. Pete Sonsini. You got um, it. What's it like being a CEO of a company? Wow, that's, that's, that's such an amazing question. So, it's not easy. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you that, mm -hmm. right? And also from the outside looking in, um, you don't see the, the challenges, but also the amount of grit, the passion, the desire that's necessary from a day-to-day -day basis and the relentless execution, right? I learned that from Ali Gosi at Databricks, the relentless execution that's necessary to be able to drive and build the next unicorn every single day from whether or not it's the product teams to the engineering part of the organization 
to the sales and go to market. You know, the first, you know, you know, seven figures of revenue that we created was founder led sales, right? So, you know, I tell a lot of the, you know, entrepreneurs that are interested in trying to, you know, raise 20 plus million millions of dollars like we did, like, look, if you can't close the first 10 deals within an organization yourself getting started, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to see the full potential of where you want to go. So you have to take on the persona of a sales engineer, but also be as good as on the innovation side as necessary to be able to drive the organization. And when you think about those different facets, a CEO has to have intimate knowledge of every single area well enough to be able to help the organization have a vision, right? And really staying true to that vision, no matter what adversity comes your way, what challenges, staying true to that vision, right? Because that vision is what's gonna lead the organization and you can't waver, you can't falter on that vision as well. Yeah. Well, let's reflect on your vision a little bit, man. Talk a little bit about your background. You grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, right? One of seven kids, five brothers, one sister. What was it like growing up in Jacksonville? What was that like? Wow, you know, you know, um, you know, we, you know, we call Jacksonville, Florida, um, if you ask people in the city, you know, the, the home of the Jaguars, the home of the Jaguars. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there today, <laughs> you know, but but the analogy is, you know, they reference it as Jack and kill Florida. Wow. Right. And the reason for that is because, you know, it for many years has been the murder capital of Florida. Right. So when you think about my background, um, you know, I come from a socioeconomically disadvantaged background, um, you know, where, um, you know, I can remember one tax season, you know, my, my parents did taxes and, you know, they made $13,000 in a year, right? Um, but, you know, all of those challenges, you know, built the character that I have today, which ultimately, um, you know, helps you have the compassion and the empathy as a CEO, right? That's necessary. To you to for you to build a, a great company yeah as a kid sitting there i know you said your dad used to work at at and yes. if i'm mistaken uh and he used to bring home these computers he used to sit yeah. there and fix them and yep. you know just get immense uh, immersed in that world but um i say you know even as a child you did that you had to watch cartoons right what was your favorite <laughs> cartoon as, as a kid <laughs> You know, Inspector Gadget, <laughs> putting together devices. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I'd say, you know, unfortunately, I I didn't watch a lot of TV. Wow. Right. I, as a child, um, but when I did, um, one of the things that I really liked, um, I I really liked, um, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog. Why yeah. Sonic? What stood out about Sonic? You know, um, Sonic was was really cool for me, uh, because of the the speed and the pace that he would run at mm. in order to get things done, Yeah. right? And, you know, for myself, you know, I take on that, um, you know, that element of, you know, drive, you can ask any, any of the employees in my organization, right, um, who the hardest working individual is, and they're gonna say, you know, Dr. Harvey does not sleep, mm. right? And the reason that, you know, I take on that, that aspect is because the, the team and the organization, right, they, they feed off of the energy, right, of the CEO. And I try to make sure that they understand the passion that I have, the grit, the will, the desire, and really, you know, that those attributes, you know, are the same attributes that I used to see as a young kid watching Sonic the Hedgehog as yeah. well. Yeah, wow. 2009, man, you go really fast, right fast. Mississippi, Mississippi Valley State University, you graduated from there, right? You went on a football scholarship, Jerry Rice, his alma mater, mm -hmm. um, played football and basketball. No NFL, no NBA, why not? <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> that is a, another level uh, with regards to, um, you know, how good of a player that you have to be to cross that chasm. So, you know, I was, a, 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 I was better at um, basketball than I was at football, mm -hmm. but um, as a 6'1 cornerback versus a 6'1 point guard, you have a better shot at making it to the league, yeah. right? To the NBA or the NFL, specifically the NFL, as a 6'1 cornerback, yeah. right? Yeah. So for me, you know, the um, opportunity was, um, how do I get out of the Jacksonville, Florida, right? Yeah. And leveraging a, um, a full athletic scholarship to do so, while focused on a double major in computer science and pre-med, yeah. right? Which is really hard, right? Yeah. So um, ultimately, it's a, uh, it was an opportunity for me, um, but at the same time, the NFL and the NBA was really far-fetched, but 
um, when I was a senior um, it, at Mississippi Valley State University, I had an opportunity to either pursue my, my, um, my senior year of, of sports, uh, playing both basketball and football, or take a, um, a, a full year at Harvard, or, uh, Harvard and MIT in um, uh, Harvard and MIT HST, which is the Health and Science uh, Technology Division. Yeah. Which one did you pick? I ultimately, um, <laughs> you, you know, I, even though I love the NBA and the NFL, I ended up choosing the Harvard and MIT program. Yeah. And without that program, I wouldn't be here where I'm at today. Absolutely. Well, listen, that goes from, you know, you go to Bowie State, right, and you get your master's and your Ph.D., uh, stay within the HBCU. But I want to fast forward your time to, you mentioned it earlier, NSA, right, National Security Agency, because there you were able to help lead the data scientists right there and be able to transfer that real-time data science and that analytics, right? And you saw that lapse between getting that information to your brothers, who are two mm. military personnel, yes. one is a captain, one is a major, right? So you're seeing firsthand behind the scenes in the NSA about that lapse in information, which is where AI Squared was kind of conceptualized. Where are you? Right? Are you sitting at home listening to Shaw Day, drinking wine? Like, where's <laughs> going through your head to make you say, I can come up with a company that can solve this? You, you know, um, it, it really goes back to the point um, that when I was at the National Security Agency, um, as a chief of operations data science. So I ran data science for the entire operations directorate. Um, it, it takes a lot of uh, passion in order to think that you could come up with just an idea and ultimately make it come to life and create a, a technology that's dual purpose in a way that could serve ultimately industry and the federal government. But the passion that I had behind solving that problem was because of uh, Jeremiah Harvey and Joseph Harvey, which are my two brothers that were deployed to Southwest Asia and the Middle East. And ultimately, as the Chief of Operations Data Science, it was so important for me to try to figure out how could we accelerate and simplify how these AI and machine learning algorithm insights are actually being utilized by the intelligence community analysts and the military warfighter in the field, right? And if you think about my brothers, um, the insights that we could potentially gather could directly um, provide them with the information necessary to save lives. Yeah. So understanding that problem and understanding how you know, 90% of what the data scientists were building in the organization never made it into a mission production application, ultimately was sitting on a shelf, is when I made the decision to say, hey, not only am I going to build a small prototype inside of the organization that could solve the temporary, but I'm also going to create a company that could ultimately solve the larger problem for enterprise organizations as well as federal enterprise organizations. And ultimately, one of the cool things is AI Squared uh, currently has a cooperative research and development agreement back with the National Security Agency where we're scaling out to multiple use cases within that organization. Yeah, I was talking to one of your investors, you know, over at Ansa Capital, and he's telling me, he's like, you know, it's almost like they've solved the problem that pharmaceuticals solved a long time ago, right? Imagine making all of these pharmaceutical drugs, these amazing drugs, and having no way to deploy them or distribute them, right? This is what AI Squared is doing with all of that information. But, um, you know, your dark period was one I think would probably stand out amongst entrepreneurs because we were talking, you take out a $20,000 credit card, right? You beg your wife to tap into that $500,000 retirement account, right? So that way you can build the prototype and then fund AI squared, and then you get tapped out, right? Um, and you have to go and you have to reinvent yourself from a mentality standpoint, because when you're running out of money and you got people that support you and they're relying on you and you got this idea, things can get rough, man. What did you learn about yourself in that dark period? Wow, you know, entrepreneurs call it the, the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> right? And that's when, you know, for, for, AI, uh, for AI squared as an organization, it was before the venture capital funding. Yeah. And it was, you know, how can we, you know, showcase that we have some traction and showcase that we can bring in some early revenue to actually even get the first uh, dollars of, 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 venture, of venture capital, right, or venture funding. And um, during that process, as you mentioned, the credit cards, and shout out to the wife, the, the retirement that I cashed out to ultimately support the early developers inside the organization. And we still came to a point where um, you know, the challenge is the mentality coming from, you know, the, the federal background is you, um, you, you think about you know, how can you develop a company and build a company grassroots, right? So the, the mentality change was when we hit the valley of the shadow of death, 
where we ran out of cash, um, no more runway, uh, we hit our cash out date, and you know, it, it's, you're starting to have conversations with, with different employees about, you know, hey, we may only be able to go you know, the next couple of months before we have to hang it up. And going from there to getting um, your back against the wall where you have to make a decision, and that decision was really, you know, calling, you know, Matei Zaria and telling Matei, Matei, look, you know, we've got this idea. We think it has huge commercialization potential. Please help us, right? And Matei making the connection to the, you know, uh, A16Zs, the NEAs, the, the, the batteries, the, 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 the tier one venture capital investment organizations that ultimately helped us get funding. But, you know, that valley of the shadow of death was really the point where you have to evolve. Right? It's about evolution. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell the young generation of entrepreneurs. There's going to be a point where um, in order for you to be successful, you're going to have to evolve as an entrepreneur. And that evolution is actually what's going to take you to the next level in your entrepreneur journey. Yeah. You guys kind of hit the scene before the chat GPT wave, right? Mm -hmm. One of your investors kind of you know, brought that up. But um, also, you're entering a time now where money is tight. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like it's not a lot out of there. There's a lot of dry powder out there. Investors are a little bit more conservative, higher interest rates and just being a little bit more a uh, little bit more tight with their money. How were you guys able to go and raise a serious A? Like what did you say that was so convincing to them? Because you investors are currently they always <laughs> saying, no, this is not going to work. Tell me why it's not going to work. But you guys ultimately, again, you, you get through a serious A for that. Yeah. How'd you do it? I mean, if, if you think about right now, um, we're in this you know, last year, right, where organizations have spent tens of millions of dollars building these generative AI technologies um, or these large language models mm -hmm. that are ultimately, you know, these very large algorithms, right? And these very large algorithms are, you know, trained on the universe of data on the internet, but they're also, there's a aspect of you know, reinforcement learning with human feedback. But it's essentially, you know, if you are using ChatGPT for an example, it's essentially the opportunity for you to provide feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, is the answer correct, is it wrong? And that feedback ultimately is also what the um, algorithm uh, suppliers um, use to tune the model to increase the accuracy and performance, right? So there was really a couple things on the AI squared side that we were doing, right? It's really about now that you have these very powerful generative AI large language models from these different algorithm providers, how do you first, you know, when you think about the gold rush, it was the, the pixels, the axes, and the shovels, right? So it's the same thing with AI squared, right? We're the picks, you know, pick the axe, the, the shovel that's associated with how do you accelerate how the insights from these you know, very large language models are integrated inside of applications. And then the second thing, which is really important, is how do you start to leverage the feedback from the human in the loop to increase the accuracy and performance of the model in the workflows of the business? Mm. You got my head spinning again, Doc. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, man, uh, moving on right fast and uh, get you out of here on some uh, rapid reaction stuff, right? And again, you know, 13.8 million raised, and you guys are going to use this money to operationalize the business, right? And one of your investors, you know, kind of mentioned the fact that what stood out about AI Square was you guys had uh, corporate and government customers, right? You're working with the U.S. Navy, you're working with the uh, Air Force, uh, and a couple of other fintech, uh, fin financial companies, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, but if you break down the AI as a software, as a service sector, AI as a service, I'm assuming that's what you guys fall under, right? And that's software publishing, AI as a service. Is that accurate in that uh, way? Both, but we do both service um, from a perspective of once we deploy our technology inside of the organization, All right. we, we, we empower the organization with the tech, and we also provide the services to help them um, build out to new use cases as right. well. Yeah, yep. yeah absolutely. Exactly. Uh, I will ask you this, um, and I thought, you know, again, one of your investors said it perfectly. I love talking to any AI. I got to talk to him again. <laughs> um, but, you know, he kind of mentioned how AI is going to, it's a, another democratizing mm. technology, right? Yes. Um, and not only that, but it's going to change the way that humans interact yes. with computers forever, yes. right? It's forever gonna change where yes. creators are gonna have amplifiers. Yes. That's what AI is gonna be able to yes. do, right? Describe, I and mean, I have to ask you, or define, everybody have their own definition, define AI. What is it yes. to Dr. Benjamin Harvey? 
Yeah, so you know, when you think about artificial intelligence, um, there's a couple of different areas that all converge, right? So um, you know, think about Amazon Alexa, you know, um, um, speech to text and text to speech, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also you've got computer vision, right? You've got um, agent-based technologies. Um, you've got you know, the core aspect of machine learning as well, right? Um, so what you really have is a convergence of multiple technologies that are ultimately providing you with the ability to augment the cognitive decision-making process of humans, mm -hmm. right? So it's all about, you know, how do you provide a human with additional insights from a machine learning perspective? Um, but how do you provide a human with um, the addition to their skill set from a perspective of being able to solve problems with necessary information that comes from an algorithm to supplement their current internal knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wanted to quote that uh, Ken Griffin, right, the CEO of Citadel. He says, you know, the impact generative AI he was talking about the end is going to be call centers, translation work, producing content for Hollywood. So all of that stuff kind of, kind of falls under that, man. Advice to entrepreneurs, what would you tell them about AI and what to focus on, software or hardware? And I know you got a love for them both, <laughs> doctor, right, because you're building computers yes. and you that. Software or hardware, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're looking to maybe start something, what do you tell them? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a software guy at heart, um, but we, we also provide a lot of the communication that's necessary to be able to scale the software um, on the hardware as well. Um, but when you think about, you know, organizations that are starting right now, it's really about the algorithm itself, right? You think about OpenAI, it's about the algorithm, right? They built this large language model that has, you know, this powerful algorithm that's you know, providing, you know, uh, responses that are associated with anything that you can think of as far as a prompt, right? So, you know, the opportunity now for entrepreneurs is to really think about how can you start to personalize those algorithms to really understand individual behavior, whether it's implicit behavior or whether it's explicit behavior, understand individual behavior so that, you know, when you c create a prompt in you get a response, it's not just a response that's associated with, you know, the world view, but it's a response that is directly correlates with not only your behavior, but the knowledge that you have as an individual. And it provides you with more of like a, a co-pilot, right, for a specific individual, mm -hmm. right? So when, when I think about, you know, as we talk to the entrepreneurs that are out there, it's really how can you take these, you know, large language models, democratize them not only for organizations, but personalize them for the end users that are actually going to be leveraging the results in their workflows. Yeah, I mean, listen, software, as you said, right, that publishing, software publishing, $528 billion sector in the U.S. alone, uh, according to Ibis World. Um, U.S. presidential race, right, last before I get you out of here on good to great, uh, without choosing sides, right, what do you want to see or hear from the candidates? You are a CEO of a company, an up-and-coming company, one that we hope matches Databricks, right? It's a $43 <laughs> billion dollar company, according to Forbes. Yes. Um, what do you want to see from the candidates? Here from the candidacy. See, yeah, you you know, um, you know, one of the things that's it's, it's extremely important for enterprise organizations is, you know, how do you um, create um, the right um, policies, the rules, the regulations that can um, allow uh, enable organizations to truly foster um, the the AI technologies within the organization. Because you know, many organizations, what happens is is that the technology really takes off. But the, the rules, the policies, and the regulations are a little slower to catch up with the technology. And ultimately, once they go into effect, you have to pull back mm -hmm. some features, functionality of the technology to abide with those rules and regulations. So, yeah. so one of the opportunities for us right now is to get ahead, right? Where, um, you know, whether it's a sandbox where we are starting to, you know, test those models um, or test these companies' technologies and capabilities so that we can ultimately have a, um, an approved set of uh, AI technologies that are ready for the market. But ultimately, we have to be able to get ahead on the AI technology policies, right? The, the rules, the regulations that are supporting organizations and how they can conduct, conduct AI in a trustworthy and an assured manner 
inside these organizations. Yeah, European laws are already in full effect, writing AI laws, and again, they may have to scale back over there exactly. to kind of uh, make sure that they're, you know, kind of staying within the operating uh, procedures of what That's the law right. says. Good to great time, get you out of here. My favorite business book, right? Dr. Uh, Jim Collins, uh, I don't know if he's a doctor, but Jim Collins, good to great book. Um, what's the difference between a good AI platform and a great one? You know, um, a great AI platform is use case agnostic. Use case right. agnostic. Right, meaning that no matter what use case an organization has, it's able not to, to not only handle that use case, right? Whether it's you know from multiple customer segments, but it's also a platform that connects the algorithm insights to the actual business operations, right? Don't stop short where you're just creating the technologies, but how do you ultimately leverage those insights to support the business or the mission in the federal government? where the results are actionable, they're relevant, they're timely, they're contextualized, and they ultimately enable the adoption, the increased adoption of AI across an enterprise organization. There you go, smart, principled risk taker. That's what one of your customers mm -hmm. said about you when I was asking, right? Smart, awesome. principled risk taker. I said, why? Said, they're not just giving PhDs away, right? So clearly smart. Um, appreciate the time, Dr. Harvey. Congrats on the raise again, 13.8 million Series A, and you will operationalize the business on this, get a CRO, right? A Chief Revenue Officer, yes, and all of that stuff. Y'all hiring, <laughs> so I'm assuming now. You got $13 million, you, you hiring out of a sudden, right? You got it. Appreciate it, man. Listen, welcome back. I'll get you back to the NASDAQ market site because AI is the future and we're going to need all the expertise from you right and you're a smart guy so you know you're going to prove us right you got it appreciate got it. it dr harvey here at the nasdaq market site thank you for watching